Hey everyone, today I'm starting what's going to be a long series that introduces how to fly in Microsoft Flight Simulator with the instruments instead of flying visually. I really do prefer flying visually in Flight Sim to enjoy the incredible scenery that the game can generate, but I've also always been curious as to how to fly precision departures and approaches, and the only real way to do that is with instrument flying, so here we are. I'd also like to eventually try something like VATSIM or IVIO, which I've never tried before because I don't feel like I have all the required skills to do it properly. I've heard those communities can be a little bit picky about who they let on and keep on their networks, so I've never even ventured to try it. I'm hoping that all the time I'm going to spend learning and explaining all of this to you will help me get all those skills, so we'll see how that goes. In this video, I'm going to be covering all of the upcoming topics that I'll be looking at in the coming weeks and months ahead. I'm also going to cover why instrument flying exists and do some very basic IFR flight planning in the game. And I'm going to wrap up by looking at all of the instruments that you're going to want to understand and know how to operate to be able to do proper IFR flying in Flight Sim. I also want to preface this by pointing out that I'm learning this myself as I'm making these videos, so I'm likely going to get some stuff wrong along the way, so feel free to correct me in the comments. There are lots of different moving parts that go into instrument flying, and most of them are modeled and reproducible in Flight Sim. Some of the topics I'm going to be covering in the coming weeks and months are how to build a very basic IFR flight plan, how to do instrument departures, how to handle the airplane once you're in the air and flying under instrument conditions, as well as approaches like VOR, ILS, GPS, and a few other things thrown in there for good measure. The one thing that is a little bit unfortunate that as of the time I'm recording this doesn't work so well is the ATC system. You can use it to start to learn the basics of what communication should look like under instrument flying, but it really doesn't have much value other than that, and it's not going to give you what you need to go fly on that sim either. For that reason, I'm going to focus on the different procedures that we have to follow to fly under instruments, and I'm going to ignore the ATC component for the most part. If we're lucky, by the time I wrap up this series, they'll have improved it, but I won't hold my breath. There is a lot of content to cover there, and I expect this to be about a 12-part series, if not more. That'll take me the next three to six months to complete, but like I said in the opening, the goal is really to learn as I go and share that with you all, and hopefully by the end I'll be ready to jump onto a live ATC system like VATSIM and maybe just do a live stream of that. I'll also be continuing to produce some VFR videos, and I'm probably going to swap from one week to the other from a VFR video over to an IFR video. Alright, with all that said, let's start learning about instrument flight rules. The main reason instrument flying exists in the first place is to allow planes to fly in inclement weather where they can't necessarily see where they're going, but they need to to be able to get back safely on the ground. Instrument flight rules allows you to see where you are and where you're going even when you can't see anything out of the windscreen. It's accomplished by detailed flight plans that specify precisely where the airplane has to fly to get to where it's going. For very basic IFR flights like I'm going to be doing for these videos, I don't even need to use any external tools or programs to build my flight plan. I have pretty much everything I need in here, but I will complement with a few little things that I can find easily on Google. The first flight in this series is going to be from Honolulu to Kahului. It's currently set up as a VFR flight direct from one airport to the other. Now we're going to be doing IFR though, so what I'm actually going to do is in the drop down I am going to choose IFR and I'm going to choose low altitude airways. Low altitude airways have a ceiling of around 18,000 feet and I'm going to be staying well below that, which is why I chose it. If I was going above 18,000 feet in a jet or an airliner, in that case I would end up choosing the high altitude airways. Now as you can see, it's created a much more detailed flight plan. There are also a few extra drop downs that appeared once I chose IFR. Those are the departure and arrival procedures that you can choose. Flight Sim automatically figured out from my route which departure and arrival procedures to use, but I can change those myself if I want, either through the dropdown or I can just click on one of the different arrows which is going to pick a different procedure. Each departure and each arrival is going to be slightly different and obviously depending on the prevailing winds and which runway you're taking off from, you're going to want to pick the most appropriate departure for it. In this case, it actually does make the most sense to use this departure right here since I'm going to be taking off from 26 right and heading out east all the way into my arrival. The same thing is true for the arrival. You can pick another arrival if you want, but in this case, it makes the most sense to pick the Camps 3 arrival because it's the one that lines up the best with my flight plan. 
Each one of these procedures has an associated chart that describes the procedure in a lot more detail. It includes altitudes, navigation aids, and a bunch of other details like radio frequencies that you're going to need to safely take off and land when the visibility is near zero. You can get these charts in a few different ways. The easiest solution that I found, which is pretty much completely free, is to just type in the name of the departure or arrival into Google. I've been able to find charts for all the airports I've looked for so far just by doing this. Oftentimes it'll come up with something on FlightAware, but there are a few other sites that'll tend to have a couple of charts as well. The chart might be a little bit out of date, but for the purposes of flying in flight sim, it's going to be more than sufficient. Another option is to install Little NavMap, which is an open source software that reads the data from FlightSim, and it can show you all of the details of the departure and arrival procedure. It's not quite clean as looking at the real chart though, so I definitely prefer trying to find the actual physical chart in the PDF format that I can print off. The last option is to get a paying service like Navigraph. They specialize in charts for flight simulation, but I personally find this to be a bit more than what I'm willing to pay for a hobby. Once you have found the chart, you can either print it out or if you've got a second monitor, just have it handy on that second screen so that when you're flying, you can reference it very easily. That should be all you need to get started from a flight planning perspective. There's a lot more details obviously I could go into and I'm going to explore those in the coming videos. I'm going to use the Cessna 208 Grand Caravan for all of the IFR videos that I'm going to be producing to keep it nice and consistent. Think of it like a giant version of the Cessna 172 with a lot more power and a much higher cruising altitude. The only airplane you really can't use for doing this would be something like the Savage Cub because it doesn't have all the instruments you're going to need, but otherwise you can pretty much use anything you want. I recommend either the Cessna 208 or a prop based plane that has a glass cockpit rather than the traditional steam gauges. It's going to make everything just a little bit easier because you're going to be able to see what you're doing just that wee little bit better than you can with the traditional gauges. One thing I've been playing around with is trying to create the perfect instrument conditions with the weather system. I succeeded to an extent by having a first cloud layer that starts all the way at the bottom of 500 feet. It goes up to around 2000 feet, so when the airplane takes off you're very quickly in the clouds and you can get out of them fairly easily as well. I also added a second layer just a little bit higher at around 6,000 feet, just so that there's a little bit more cloud coverage as I get up higher. The visibility still doesn't extend as low as I'd like, but one way that I found to artificially increase it is to add precipitation. The more precipitation you add, the lower the visibility gets, but it's still not perfect. I'm open to suggestions on how to improve these conditions, so feel free to pop them into the comments. I eliminated the wind from my practice because I want to be able to focus on the technique and not worry too much about the wind for now. That's the beauty of the game is you can slowly increase the difficulty level so once you feel comfortable with not seeing where you're going you can add in a little wind just to make it just a little bit more challenging. A quick reminder before I do get going, if you do get some value out of this video please make sure to hit like and subscribe, it really helps out. As you can see, I'm already on approach to Maui because I want to explain how to use the different instruments in flight. I'm not going to go into the details today about how to do everything that I'm doing to do the ILS landing. That'll be in a future video, but for now I want to cover all of the instruments that you need to be aware of and know how to operate to do instrument flying. Probably the most important instrument when you're doing IFR flying is the attitude indicator. As you can see right now, I really can't see much out of the cockpit and the attitude indicator has effectively become my eyes and ears. It's telling me which direction my airplane is pointing. Is my nose in the air? Is it pointing down? Or am I in a turn? Even in a real airplane, it's really easy to become disoriented when you're in the clouds and the attitude indicator is your primary way to know which way your airplane is pointing. The altimeter, heading, and airspeed indicators are all much more important as well. When you're flying in IFR conditions, you're going to be expected to be able to fly the plane precisely according to the procedure that's been prescribed to you. You also need to be able to follow any requests that you might get from air traffic control to either hold a heading, altitude, or airspeed. That's how ATC achieves spacing between airplanes to keep everybody safe. The vertical speed indicator becomes a little bit more important as well and you're expected to use at least 500 feet per minute for your climbs or descents. All of those instruments have a digital display in the glass cockpit so it becomes really easy to start chasing after a precise number. 
You really only need to be close enough to the actual values though because the slightest little pitch or attitude change can change your altitude or airspeed by one or two knots. You should be trying to keep within 100 feet of your assigned altitude and 10 knots of your assigned airspeed. You'll want to get your heading as precisely as possible though. The best way to monitor all of these instruments that I've just spoken of is to use something called the hub and spoke system. For example, what I'll do is I'll start from my attitude indicator and I'll head out and I'll check my airspeed is correct. Then I'll come back and make sure the attitude indicator is still right. And then I'll probably check my heading next and come back to the attitude indicator again. And then I'll check on my altitude and come back to the attitude indicator again. I'll continue that the whole way down to the ground while I'm flying the airplane manually and I can't see anything out of the cockpit. One not so obvious instrument that you need to be able to read when you're doing IFR flights is the turn coordinator, which is integrated to the compass. You can see there are two little notches on either side of the current heading of the airplane. When you start a turn, you're going to see there's going to be a little magenta arrow that appears and it's going to get wider and wider as you increase the bank angle. If you line up the arrow that appears with the furthest notch, you're going to achieve something that's called a standard rate or a rate one turn. If you hold that bank angle, you're going to end up doing a 360 degree turn in precisely two minutes. That's going to allow ATC to have a better idea of how long it's going to take you to perform a maneuver, which is going to help them to space out the airplanes. If you're using the autopilot, all the turns that it makes are going to be done at a standard rate. And speaking of the autopilot, you're going to want to be familiar with the five most frequently used modes, which are ALT, FLC, VS, HDG, and NAV. When you're first learning IFR, it's a lot easier to leverage the autopilot to be able to free you up to be able to read the procedure and let the airplane fly itself. There are a bunch of other modes on the autopilot and I'm going to be teaching you those as we go throughout the series. I recently released a video that explains how to use the autopilot, so if you're not familiar with it at all, I'd recommend you check it out. I'll add a link to it right above me. Next, you're going to want to get used to handling the navigation radios at the top left of the primary flight display. The airplane can tune two nav radios at any given time, and each nav radio has an active frequency and a standby frequency. The standby frequency is on the left and the active is on the right. You can make an adjustment to the standby nav frequency using the knob on the left hand side of the primary flight display. You're always changing the standby frequency though, so when you do want to use that frequency that you've just set, what you've got to do is press the little double-sided arrow, and it's going to flip the two frequencies to make the standby frequency the active frequency. You can see that at the moment I've got the active frequency tuned to 110.1, which is the inbound ILS runway 26 approach at Maui. You can tell that it's tuned properly, one obviously because it's got the little IOGG next to it, which is the identifier for that approach. Lastly, I really recommend that you get a good feel for the airplane that you're choosing to use to learn IFR with first. The last thing you want when you're trying to fly with instruments is to fight the airplane and not know how to fly it in different situations like climbs, descents, and approaches. I also made a video that will allow you to discover how to fly any airplane smoothly. I'll add a link to that one as well in the video. In that video, I create a little cheat sheet that explains how to fly the airplane by the numbers, which I really find invaluable when I'm trying to do something at the same time as flying the airplane, because I can just set the power and pitch how it needs to be, and the airplane will just magically fly itself. The next video in the IFR series is probably going to drop in a few weeks' time and will most likely be on standard instrument departures. As usual, if you did get some value out of this video, please make sure to hit like and subscribe. It makes a huge difference. And as well, if you have any comments, feel free to put them below. See you next time.